Okay. So the next part of our program is where we hand out the, the Carol Paul Awards and the Peter White Award. And I'll let Chris. Okay, so so our two nominees are, I'm going to let Beth handle this. Dan Reedholm has nominated John Parlin, and I'm going to let um, Dan talk to that at this point. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. So before I introduce you, to this year's award recipient, I thought I would take uh, just a moment to say a few words about Helen Longyear Paul. And um, for those uninitiated to learn something about the history of this truly remarkable woman. Uh, as I grew up, my father, C. Fred Reedholm, mentioned Mrs. Paul constantly. Uh, when he was a young man, uh, she was a mentor to him, and uh, he gave her a little peace with his voracious appetite for local history uh, during her years as a past director of the Marquette County Historical Society when it was located uh, at the top of Front Street Hill. A graduate of Smith College, she went on to attend uh, MIT's uh, School of Architecture. She was one of the first female grads of that program. Uh, she married Carol Paul, who was a distinguished naval commander, and they traveled all over the wor world together. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, it's said that um, when they were stationed in Guam, she assisted in the designing of the national flag of Guam. Uh, she and her husband uh, started the Longyear Realty Corporation, which is still in operation today. They had a thriving dairy farm up at Ives Lake. Milk was loaded aboard the train in Big Bay and shipped down to Marquette on a morning basis. And um, she was very well-spoken, very distinguished. She had a sister, Abby Roberts, <clears throat> who lived in the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright house uh, at uh, Deer Track, which is on the west end of town. On a typical Friday afternoon, Abby Roberts and Helen Paul would have coffee together at the Historical Society, and uh, that was their chance to catch up on the area's happenings. Uh, my father was a young man at the time. He could not resist being around these charismatic, well-traveled, well-heeled women. And he would show up at these, these meetings and he would pepper them with questions. And uh, if they didn't have the answer to the questions, they would point him in the direction to go to research. And uh, a lot of the groundwork for his books, uh, Superior Heartland, uh, Backwoods History, and Michigan Copper were laid during those conversations with Helen Longyear Paul and Abby Roberts. Now, regarding this year's recipient, uh, John Parlin and my father, of course, were very close friends, and they shared a passion for local history. A radiologist by trade with a BA in history from Hartford's Trinity College. Uh, Dr. Parlin's uh, passion for history resulted in his first book, which I'll let him tell you more about. It's called Harvesting the Wilderness, the Tioga Lumber Company in Anota Township, a microcosm of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. It came out in 2011. And his follow-up to that was The Macabre to the Mundane, Death, Life, and Medicine in Marquette County, Michigan, during the early 1900s. Uh, that book came out in 2020. Both of these are available at Amazon.com. It is uh, 
coupled with the authorship of those two books, uh, John Parlin was also uh, a co-author with myself um, in uh, relating the story of the return, um, how the bones of Father Marquette found their way from Milwaukee University back to St. Ignace uh, last year. And there will be an event in October where you can learn more about that. So uh, for the, all of these reasons and more, um, I can't think of a better, a better a distinguished local individual uh, to receive this award than John Parlin. So I commend to you, Dr. John Parlin. John? Can you adjust that for me a little bit? Another way. Good evening. And many thanks to Dan for his beautifully written nomination for the Helen Young Lanier Paul Award. Would that I could write as well. I'm honored to receive the Helen Longyear Paul Award, something that I would not have believed to be possible. When my wife Tori and I came up to the UP in 1990, it was apparent that the people reveled in their long and rich history. It was everywhere, all the way from Marquette Regional History Center to the UPERS tourist trap in Ishpeming. With this as background, I quickly returned to my previous love of history, my major in college, followed by a hiatus of 40 years as a radiologist. The first book, Harvesting the Wilderness, uh, began very simply with Ginny and Chuck Foreman suggesting a trifold handout for the trailhead of the Tioga Historical Pathway just south of their camp on Laughing Fish or Laughing Whitefish Point. After I went to the internet, the project mushroomed into a 300-page book, including 100 pages of indices, appendices. There were noteworthy contributors to the manuscript, including B. Anderson, writing about alternative occupations, Bruce Veneber, retired DNR employee, talking about the lumber industry, Jim Carter on trains, and Mike Zudema, from the DNR, the designer of the Tioga Historical Pathway. While the book is a history of Anoda Township going back to the 1600s, the focus on the Tioga Lumber Company, which was in business between 1905 and 1907. It was a typical small lumber company that bought 3,000 acres, brought in a railroad spur, from the east-west main line of the DSSNA to the south, had a steam-driven lumber mill, bunkhouse, mess hall, and even a post office. After the brutal winter in 1907, they rolled up the rails and moved the operation to Munising with only traces of the operation visible today, including some parts of the foundation and the stone structure for the steam engine and the circular saw. The 1.6 mile walk is delightful and well-maintained by the friends of Tioga. The second book is The Macabre to the Mundane, Life, Death, and Medicine in Marquette County during the early 1900s. When I was working as a volunteer in the Long Year Library, Rosemary Michelin, pulled two blue shoe boxes off the stacks, put them in front of me and said, I think you may be interested in these. As a retired physician, boy was I ever. The boxes contained 2,500 Marquette County burial permits from 1900 to 1930. They listed the name, age, sex, physician, funeral home and cause of death. The problem with the data was that there was no secondary diagnosis, i.e. cause of death, heart attack, period, instead of saying cause of death, heart attack in a patient with thyroid disease. The second cluster of 1,000 deaths from the coroner's request stored at the Marquette University archives overseen by Marcus Robbins. One of the assistants and I spent one week reading these 1,000 coroner's reports. 
The problem with this set of patients was similar in that all the causes were traumatic and secondary diagnosis is not listed. Since I'm computer illiterate, Marge Forslund patiently helped me to make sense of this data. The objective was to identify the 10 most common causes of death between 1900 and 1930, and to expand on each of these topics both before and after these dates. The bottom line was that disease, heart disease and trauma were tied for first place. The sections on shaft iron mining make fascinating reading. There certainly are a lot of ways to kill yourself working in the shaft mines and related, related industries, such as explosives, logging, trains, and barroom balls. balls. A number of the coroner's reports are included in the appendix. Well worth your time to read. Um, Chris, do we have the photos of the boat projected anywhere? Okay. Uh, the photos that are going to be projected are of a 16 foot 1881 cedar strip boat restored over 12 years by Mary Brahms, Edgar, and me with lots of help. Uh, I also noticed that her name was spoken many different ways. Mary preferred Bromsa, uh, Pete preferred Brahms, and Bill, I don't know what he preferred. <laughs> the boat was built by Bowditch Company in Skinny Atlas, New York. The first owner lived, lived in Detroit. Now it found its way in 2006 to Mary's salvage yard on the bank of the Rock River at the junction of the Rock River and M28. The photos show this wreck in arriving in my yard in Sand River and fully restored at its coming out party uh, at Presque Isle in 2018. The boat has now been delivered to a permanent home, the Skinny Atlas Historical <laughs> Society Museum after 140 years being away. Chris has copies of the booklet describing the restoration for those interested I'm thrilled with the Helen Longyear Paul Award, and I'm sorry not to be there with you. Zoom is okay, but certainly not first choice for any of us. Thank you. Well, Hunter is walking around giving out John's latest book. Thank you, John. Does anyone have a question they would like to ask John? Now. Yes. We're good? Well, yes. John, congratulations. This was a long time coming. Thank you for all your work. Pictures, <laughs> Pictures are now up. What's your next book, John? <laughs> your next book. Um, I need to talk to Dan, who's my editor in chief, and we have a read of this. <laughs> okay. so, how, how, about a bio how about a biography of Helen Paul? Yeah, we can. Yeah. On behalf of John Parlin, uh, Chris is accepting this award, which we will send to him with bells, whistles, and ribbons. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.